half of our half of the people here were more content to listen to new jobbies and watch me play onslaught than to hear you and I talk and read stories. Maybe well, I don't know. Should we link to the IRC or not? I never know. Sometimes no, I feel like it's rude. <laughs> I, IRC is not is not very pleased with me today. Any as it is. Oh, what happened? I accidentally <laughs> two days ago I um, I left a uh, an auto respond. I made a, like a two second auto respond script that just replies to whenever somebody says Apple with Apple, and um, I, I forgot to to turn that off or delete it. So what happened to get, like, today? No, completely <laughs> forgot. Like, complete no legit completely forgot like two days ago so i was i got home today i was i went i went to sleep after work and i woke up after like a two-hour nap and i have like a thousand fucking messages on irc <laughs> on fucking <laughs> skype <laughs> screaming at me like apparently apparently uh test pony had because test pony has the same script uh-huh. but his but his he actually bothered to put like a timer and like checkers and things in there like that i didn't do because it was just a 10 second joke but his script got fired off, which fired off my script, and this went into a 30-minute feedback loop that just spammed <laughs> IRC with Apple for a half hour, and like, and Boris and and uh, and Far were not there, so no one could do anything about it because uh, Test Pony and I both have um, op tr- status on the channel, uh-huh. so no one could do anything, and it was just 30 minutes of spamming Apple, and it pissed off like three shit posters who took it to VG and then got themselves banned. So, so what you're saying is that IRC for 30 minutes was clop, basically. It was basically. It was. It was <laughs> it's basically. It was 30 minutes of, of nonstop, literally every two seconds, Apple. <laughs> Who? I mean, it, if I needed to use the IRC, the like the open IRC channel for something, I can see why that would be irritating. But no one. Uses no one it needs for shit. to use like, it. <laughs> Boris doesn't even need to use it. You just go there to have a giggle when you feel like it and you have time, and that's it. I mean, who's right. really yeah. ass-pained about the 30-second Apple-thon? Uh, let's see. Uh, fucking Koala was pissed about it. Um, Please. Uh, the memer of memers <laughs> was irritated at the... Well, you out-memed Koala. Uh, I guess good on you for that. He got, and, then he, and then he went and got himself banned from VG for shitposting, which deleted 10%. Like, 10% of the thread is gone. It deleted, like, 100 posts when he got banned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I missed all of that. I had no idea. And uh, you, this all this all happened within the last like three hours. Oh jeez. Yeah. And, no. Uh, I so I check I check uh, for CCG in the off season. Uh, maybe once every two you weeks. Don't don't go it, don't go there. It's it's, it's infrequent. It's a silly place. <laughs> <laughs> can oh god I almost said Canterlot Camelot. Yeah. No. It's <laughs> it's a disease. You can't break free of it once it has a hold of you. Yeah. Well. Yeah, since we can't, or can't, since we're not going to link to IRC, and since there's not currently a cup thread going on at MLP that I could uh, use for my own what nefarious purposes, I think we should probably group, just go. Is the thread mean, down? Uh, is that thread dead? Did that die? Oh, the Jersey one? Yeah, that yeah. died a few days ago. Oh. Uh, probably for the better, but... Uh, yeah, it, yeah, th- probably for the better. I, 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 I know I paid my invoice yesterday, which was the last day. So. <laughs> Naturally, at the very last, did you get confirmation that everything was all right? I did. Okay, good. Yeah, no, I. But I little, l- little does he know that I used my PayPal debit card. Oh, that's right, because there was the, there was some drama about the, if you can call it that, about not being able to use PayPal. Yeah. Oh well. But I did it anyway. You know, I think what's also amuses me about that was, it was credit cards only, and you used a debit card. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They don't allow me. They don't let me have credit cards anymore. I owe too too much money. Oh, you mean you're not rolling in rig bucks? No. Well, they don't accept rig bucks where I shop. It's unfortunate. <laughs> I'm gonna march straight down to Walgreens and tell them that rig bucks are a perfectly suitable currency. I tried over. I, I, they don't let me in that store anymore. Oh. All right. Well. Yeah. Our song is done then. Uh, so what we've got lined up are three stories. Hopefully I can get through three stories before the baby party spills into the room here. Fucking Rubber baby Norman. buggy bumpers. Um, we'll start you have with a baby party going on right now? Yeah, yeah, right now. Uh, so I'm in the office right now, and then Mrs. Bro uh, is in the living room with a bunch of her coworkers doing a, sort of a baby shower, except it's after the baby was here. And she had offered to have them 
throw the party here at our house because they were talking about, oh, maybe we'd go somewhere and have breakfast, but they couldn't really decide where to do it. I was like, oh, just have everybody come over here. So there's a little shindig going on See, out in the living room. And she's I like, can't. Well, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, she, uh, she's like, well, you know, I mean, when the party's going on, you can you can go to the gym or something. I was like, do you not want me in the house? She's like, no, no, it's okay. She's just, you know, if you want to do something, I was like, oh, well, maybe I'll, I'll uh, go in the office and do an episode. And she kind of freaked out and she didn't want me to do it. And it came out that, uh, that... she was confusing me reading spooky stories with uh, commentating during cup games, which <laughs> the, the, the big difference is that when reading spooky stories, I'm not shouting things like rape and things that might irritate the guests in the other room. So eventually we we figured it out and she said it would be all right <laughs> domestic bliss <sighs> see i i it because i worked all night it doesn't seem like two in the afternoon to me it it seems like 5 a.m oh oof. So. That, see well you can you can share german bros pain because he had um I out of nowhere had said, "Hey, uh, I would read a story with you," and I got really excited about that. But by the time that I, I did an episode that was last weekend in Germany, it was like, or I suppose he's in Sweden, but it's the same time zone, uh, five in the morning. So he was out cold, and then oh, I just shit. heard from him the next day, like, "Oh, did you wind up doing that thing?" So that's why I thought maybe an earlier stream would be better, since I know that uh, the Germans and the Brits and all of them are alive. They're just not currently yeah. tuned in. We got. Uh, Oh no! I suppose one of the people watching the stream is you. I've got the laptop yeah. and this going, so we have so one person. So it's a, it's a nice little circle jerk we've got going on. Except that there's no one to jerk, so really it's yeah. not even. And circles have more than four sides, so really, I don't even know what you would call it. I think this is art in its purest form because it's not for an audience. It's it's for my own artistic satisfaction. Mm. Mm. Okay. So uh, first story up, let me just go ahead and bring up the title card here. Oh, <laughs> uh, it turns out our other listener is Bent, who... Oh, great. No. <laughs> I don't know why he's not responding in the Twitch, but uh, I, I, it has been revealed that you were correct after all. It is a complete circle. That's fine. We, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just, let's just hang up and do it, and we can actually do a group call. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't and know. I, he's, uh, I tried to actually. I tried getting uh, Bent to do uh, one of the lines in the story, but uh, he couldn't do it because his roommate uh, came into the room, obviously caught him masturbating. So he will not uh, be able to to join us, is my understanding. Yeah. So yes, tonight's uh, strange stories selections from the collected fantasies of Clark Ashton Smith. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and start with the resurrection of the rattlesnake. Oh, let me cue my scary music. There we go. Now, as I've told you fellows before, I haven't a red sense worth of faith in the supernatural. The speaker was Arthur Avelton, whose tales of ghostly and macabre of the ghostly and macabre had often been compared to Poe, Bierce, and Machen. He was a master of imaginative horrors, with a command of diabolically convincing details of monstrous cobweb suggestions that had often laid a singular spell on the minds of readers who were not ordinarily attracted or impressed by literature of that type. It was his own boast, often made, that all his effects were secured in a purely ratiocinative, even scientific manner by playing on the element of subconscious dread the ancestral superstition latent in most human beings. But he claimed that he himself was utterly incredulous of anything occult or phantasmal, and that he had never in his life known the slightest tremor of fear concerning such things. Abelton's listeners looked at him a little questioningly. They were John Godfrey, a young landscape painter, and Emile Schuller, a rich dilettante, who played in alternation with literature and music, but was not serious in his attentions to either. Both were old friends and admirers of Abelton, at whose house on Sutter Street in San Francisco they had met by chance that afternoon. Abelton had suspended work on a new story to chat with them and smoke a sociable pipe. He still sat at his writing table, with a pile of neatly written foolscap before him. His appearance was as normal and non-eccentric as his handwriting, and he might have been a lawyer or doctor or chemist, rather than a concoctor of bizarre fiction. The room, his library, 
was quite luxurious in sober, gentlemanly sort of fashion, and there was a little of the hauteur in its furnishings. The only unusual notes were struck by two heavy brass candlesticks on his table wrought in the form of rearing serpents and a stuffed rattlesnake that was coiled on top of one of the low bookcases. Well, observed Godfrey, if anything could convince me of the reality of the supernatural, it would be some of your stories, Appleton. I always read them by broad daylight. I wouldn't do it after dark on a bet. By the way, what's the yarn you're working on now? It's about a stuffed serpent that suddenly comes to life, replied Appleton. I'm calling it the resurrection of the rattlesnake. I got the idea while I was looking at a rattler this morning. And I suppose you'll sit here by candlelight tonight, put in Schuler, and go on with your cheerful little horror without turning a hair. It was well known that Appleton did much of his writing at night. Appleton smiled. Darkness always helps me to concentrate, and considering that so much of the action in my tales is nocturnal, the time is not inappropriate. You're welcome, said Schuler in a jocular tone. He arose to go, and Godfrey also found that it was time to depart. Oh, by the way, said their host, I'm planning a little weekend party. Would you fellows care to come over next Saturday evening? There'll be two or three others of our friends. I'll have this story off my chest by then, and we'll raise the roof. Godfrey and Schuler accepted the invitation and went out together. Since they both lived across the bay in Oakland and both were on their way home, they caught the same car to the ferry. Oh, that was this certainly a case of a living contradiction, if there ever was one, remarked Schuler. Well, of course, no one quite believes in the occult and necromantic nowadays, but anyone who can cook up such infernally realistic horrors, such thoroughgoing hair fizzlers as he does, simply hasn't the right to be so cold-blooded about it. I claim that it's really indecent. I agree, rejoined his companion. He's so damnably matter-of-fact about the way it arouses in me a sort of Halloween impulse. I want to dress up in an old sheet and play ghost or something, just to jar him out of that skeptical complacency of his. Ye gods and little ghosties, cried Schuler. I've got an inspiration. Remember what Appleton told us about the new story he's writing, about the serpent that comes to life. He unfolded the prankish idea he had conceived, and the two laughed like mischievous schoolboys plotting some novel deviltry. Why not? It should give the old lad a real thrill, chuckled Godfrey and he'll think that his fictions are more scientific than he ever dreamed before. I know where I can get one, said Schuler. I'll put in a fishing creel and hide the creel in my valise next Saturday when we go to Appleton's. Then we can watch our chance to make the substitution. On Saturday evening, the two friends arrived together at Appleton's house and were admitted by a Japanese who combined in himself the roles of cook, butler, housekeeper, and valet. The other guests, two young musicians, had already come, and Avilton, who was evidently in a mood for relaxation, was telling them a story which, to judge from the continual interruptions of laughter, was not at all in the vein for which he had grown so famous. It seemed almost impossible to believe that he could be the author of the gruesome and brain-freezing horrors that bore his name. The evening went successfully, with a good dinner, cards, and some pre-war bourbon and it was after midnight when Avilton saw his guests to their chambers and sought his own. Godfrey and Sailor didn't... Sailor? Who's Sailor? That must be you, but the... It's an it's a, one of those auto script readers that obviously didn't work right. Yar, I be Sailor. <laughs> uh, Godfrey and Emil did not go to bed, but sat up talking in their... You know, I bet it was Schuler. That's silly. It was me! Edit! Take three! Godfrey and Schuler did not go to bed, but sat up talking in the room they occupied together till the house had grown silent and it was probable that everyone had fallen asleep. Avilton, they knew, was a sound sleeper, who boasted that even a rivet factory or a brass orchestra could not keep him awake for five minutes after his head had touched the pillow. Now's your chance, whispered Schuler at last. He had taken from his valise a fishing creel, in which was a large and somewhat restless gopher snake and softly opening the door which they had left ajar, the conspirators tiptoed down the hall toward Appleton's library, which lay at the farther end. It was their plan to leave the live gopher snake in the library in lieu of the stuffed rattler, which they would remove. A gopher snake is somewhat similar to a rattler in its markings, and in order to complete the verisimilitude, Schuler had even provided himself with a set of rattles. 
which he meant to attach with thread to the serpent's tail before freeing it. The substitution, they felt, would undoubtedly prove a trifle startling, even to a person of such boilerplate nerves and unrelenting skepticism as Avelton. As if to facilitate their scheme, the door of the library stood half open. Godfrey produced a flashlight and they entered. Somehow, in spite of their merry mood, in spite of the schoolboy hoax they had planned and the bourbon they had drunk, the shadow of something dim and sinister and disquieting fell on the two men as they crossed the threshold. It was like a premonition of some unknown and unexpected menace lurking in the darkness of the book people's room where Avelton had woven so many of his weird and spectral webs. They both began to remember incidences of nocturnal horror from his stories, happenings that were ghoulishly hideous or necromantically strange and terrible. Now, such things seemed even more plausible than the author's diabolic art had made them heretofore, but neither of the men could have quite defined the feeling that came over them or could have assigned the reason for it. I feel a uh, little creepy confided Schuler as they stood in the dark library. T Turn on the flashlight, won't you? The light fell directly on the low bookcase where the stuffed rattler had been coiled, but to their surprise, they found the serpent missing from its customary place. Where is the damned thing, anyway? muttered Godfrey. He turned his light on the neighboring bookcases, and then on the floor and chairs in front of them, but without revealing the object of his search. At last, in its circlings, the ray struck Avelton's writing table, and they saw the snake which, in some mood of grotesque humor, Avelton had evidently placed on his pile of manuscript to serve in lieu of a paperweight. Behind it gleamed the two serpentine candlesticks. Ah, there you are, said Schuler. He was about to open his creel when a singular and quite unforeseen thing occurred. He and Godfrey both saw a movement on the writing table, and before their incredulous eyes, the rattlesnake coiled on the pile of paper, slowly raised its arrow-shaped head, and darted forth its forky tongue. Its cold, unwinking eyes, with a fixation of baleful intensity well-nigh hypnotic, were upon the intruders, and as they stared in unbelieving horror, they heard the sharp rattling of its tail, like withered seeds in a wind-swung pod. My god, exclaimed Schuler. The thing is alive. As he spoke, the flashlight fell from Godfrey's hand and went out, leaving them in soot-black darkness. As they stood for a moment, half petrified with astonishment and terror, they heard the rattling again, and then the sound of some object that seemed to strike the floor and falling. Once more, in a few instants, there came the sharp rattle, this time almost at their very feet. Godfrey screamed aloud, and Schuler began to curse incoherently as they both turned and ran toward the open door. Schuler was ahead, and as he crossed the threshold into the dim-lit hall, where one electric bulb still burned, he heard the crash of his companion's fall, mingled with a cry of such infinite terror, such atrocious agony, that his brain and his very marrow were turned to ice. In the paralyzing panic that overtook him, Schuler retained no faculty except that of locomotion, and it did not even occur to him that it would be possible to stop and ascertain what had befallen Godfrey. He had no thought, no desire, except to put the length of the hall between himself and that accursed library and its happenings. Avelton, dressed in pajamas, stood at the door of his room. He had been aroused by Godfrey's scream of terror. What's the matter? The story writer queried with a look of amiable surprise, which turned to a real gravity when he saw Schuler's face. Schuler was as white as a marble headstone, and his eyes were preternaturally dilated. The, the, the snake, Schuler gasped. The, the snake, the snake. It's something awful has happened to Godfrey. He, he fell with the thing just behind him. What snake? You don't mean my stuffed rattler by any chance, do you? Stuffed rattler? Yelled Schuler. The damned thing's alive! It came crawling after us, rattling under our very feet a moment ago. And then Godfrey stumbled and fell, and he he didn't get up. I don't understand, purred Avelton. The thing is a manifest impossibility, really quite contrary to all natural laws, I assure you. I killed that snake four years ago in El Dorado County and had it stuffed by an expert taxidermist. <laughs> Go and see for yourself, challenged Schuler. Avelton strode immediately to the library and turned on the lights. Schuler, mastering a little his panic and his dreadful forebodings, followed at a cautious distance. 
he found Avalton stooping over the body of Godfrey, who lay quite still in a huddled and horribly contorted position near the door. Not far away was the abandoned fishing creel. The stuffed rattlesnake was coiled in its customary place on top of the bookshelves. Avalton, with a grave and brooding mien, removed his hand from Godfrey's heart and observed, He is quite dead. Shock and heart failure, I should think. Neither he nor Schuler could bear to look very long at Godfrey's upturned face, on which was stamped as with some awful brand or acid, an expression of fear and suffering beyond all human capacity to endure. In their mutual desire to avoid the lidless horror of his dead staring, their eyes fell at the same instant on his right hand, which was clenched in a hideous rigidity and drawn close to his side. Neither could utter a word when they saw the thing that protruded from between Godfrey's fingers. It was a bunch of rattles, and on the endmost one, where it had evidently been torn from the viper's tail, there clung several shreds of raw and bloody flesh. That's the resurrection of the rattlesnake. It's a fun one. It's a short one, and it's a... a a fairly straightforward story for uh, Smith, who normally likes to depart into sort of the fantastical uh, uh, into outer space and other dimensions. So a story about a rattlesnake coming to life is, is pretty mundane, but I think a little bit more relatable in that respect. It was fun. Fun. Uh, I thank, thank you so much for uh, I enjoyed for, uh, joining it. me. That was fantastic. No problem. That was that was actually pretty good. I uh, enjoyed that a lot. All right. Well, I uh, there's a lot of stories with a lot of characters. So if I find any more that I can uh, turn into a guest one, I will definitely uh, keep you posted, and hopefully we can do it again. Awesome. Sounds good. Right, I'm gonna read some more stories. Thanks a lot, Fed. Anytime. Catch you later. Take care. Oh, uh, looks like we've got. Uh, oh shoot. Uh, looks like Bent's uh, roommate disappeared. I do have another story that involves. Uh, uh, other people, but I don't have it highlighted, so I think that might be difficult for you to follow along. So uh, why don't we try and uh, schedule something, and I'll do the highlighting, and we can do a group read uh, maybe next weekend or sometime. So now that the group readings are all taken care of, uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next story, also out of the collections of Clark Ash and Smith, as will be all the stories tonight, uh, called A Murder in the Fourth Dimension. And a quick get some water, and then we'll start on that second story. We've got uh, seven people watching. That's fantastic. Who do we got here? We've got uh, Ved, Anon Horse. Oh, I recognize that name from the uh, Twitch chat during Cup Games. And then we've got Kassar 700, who I don't recognize. And the walls are closing in, who I also don't recognize. But awesome. Thanks so much for uh, joining us. Uh, just in the nick of time. We can go ahead and get started now on. A murder in the fourth dimension. The following pages are from a notebook that was discovered lying at the foot of an oak tree beside the Lincoln Highway between Bauman and Auburn. They would have been dismissed immediately as the work of a disordered mind if it had not been for the unaccountable disappearance eight days before of James Buckingham and Edgar Halpin. Experts testified that the handwriting was undoubtedly that of Buckingham. A silver dollar and a handkerchief marked with Buckingham's initials were also found not far from the notebook. Uh, MLP does not uh, play today. Thank you, though, for asking. Also, Apple. <laughs> not everyone, perhaps, will believe that my ten years' hatred for Edgar Halpin was the impelling force that drove me to the perfecting of a most unique invention. Only those who have detested and loathed another man with the black fervor of the feeling I had conceived will understand the patience with which I sought to devise a revenge that should be safe and adequate at the same time. The wrong he had done me was one that must be expiated sooner or later, and nothing short of his death would be sufficient. However, I did not care to hang, nor even for a crime that I could regard as nothing more than the mere execution of justice, and as a lawyer, I knew how difficult, how practically impossible was the commission of a murder that would leave no betraying evidence. Therefore, I puzzled long and fruitlessly as to the manner in which Halpin should die, 
before my inspiration came to me. I had reason enough to hate Edgar Halpin. We had been bosom friends all through our school days and through the first years of our professional life as law partners. But when Halpin married the one woman I had ever loved with complete devotion, all friendship ceased on my side and was replaced by an ice-like barrier of inexorable enmity. Even the death of Alice, five years after the marriage, made no difference, for I could not forgive the happiness of which I had been deprived. The happiness they had shared during those years, like the thieves they were. I felt that she would have cared for me if it had not been for Halpin. Indeed, she and I had been almost engaged before the beginning of his rivalry. It must not be supposed, however, that I was indiscreet enough to betray my feelings at any time. Halpin was my daily associate at the Auburn Law Firm to which we belonged, and I continued to be a most welcome and frequent guest at his home. I doubt if he ever knew that I had cared greatly for Alice. I am secretive and undemonstrative by temperament, and also I am proud. No one except Alice herself ever surmised my suffering, and even she knew nothing of my resentment. Halpin himself trusted me, and nurturing as I did the idea of retaliation at some future time, I took good care that he should continue to trust me. I made myself necessary to him in all ways. I helped him when my heart was a cauldron of seething poisons. I spoke words of brotherly affection, and clapped him on the back when I would rather have driven a dagger through him. I knew all the tortures and all the nausea of a hypocrite. And day after day, year after year, I made my varying plans for an ultimate revenge. Apart from my legal studies and duties during those ten years, I apprised myself of everything available that dealt with the methods of murder. Crimes of passion allured me with a fateful interest, and I read untiringly the records of particular cases. I made a study of weapons and poisons, and as I studied them, I pictured to myself the death of Halpin in every conceivable way. I imagined the deed as being done at all hours of the day and night, in a multitude of places. The only flaw in these dreams was my inability to think of any spot that would assure perfect safety from subsequent detection. It was my bent toward scientific speculation and experiment that finally gave me the clue I sought. I had long been familiar with the theory that other worlds or dimensions may coexist in the same space with ours by reason of a different molecular structure and vibrational rate, rendering them intangible for us. One day, when I was indulging in a murderous fantasy, in which for the thousandth time I imagined myself throttling Halpin with my bare hands, it occurred to me that some unseen dimension, if one could only penetrate it, would be the ideal place for the commission of a homicide. All circumstantial evidence as well as the corpse itself would be lacking. In other words, one would have had a perfect absence of what is known as the corpus delecti. The problem of how to obtain entrance to this dimension was of course an unsolvable one, but I did not feel that it would, unless, that it would necessarily prove insoluble. I set myself immediately to a consideration of the difficulties to be overcome and the possible ways and means. There are reasons why I do not care to set forth in this narrative the details of the various experiments to which I was drawn during the next three years. The theory that underlay my tests and researches was a very simple one, but the process involved were highly intricate. In brief, the premise from which I worked was that the vibratory rate of objects in the fourth dimension could be artificially established by means of some mechanism and that things or persons exposed to the influence of the vibration could be transported thereby to this alien realm. For a time, all my experiments were condemned to failure because I was groping among mysterious powers and recondite laws whose motive principle I had not wholly grasped. I will not even hint at the basic nature of the device which brought about my ultimate success for I do not want others to follow where I have gone and find themselves in the same dismal predicament. I will say, however, that the desired vibration was attained by condensing ultraviolet rays in a refractive apparatus made of certain very sensitive materials which I will not name. The resultant power was stored in a kind of battery and could be emitted from a vibratory disc suspended above an ordinary office chair exposing everything beneath the disc to the influence of the new vibration. 
The range of the influence could be closely regulated by means of an insulative attachment. By the use of the apparatus, I finally succeeded in precipitating various articles into the fourth dimension. A dinner plate, a bust of Dante, a Bible, a French novel, and a house cat. All disappeared from sight and touch in a few instants when the ultraviolet power was turned upon them. I knew that henceforth they were functioning as atomic entities in a world where all things had the same vibratory rate that had been artificially induced by means of my mechanism. Before venturing into the invisible domain myself, it was of course necessary to have some way of returning. I invented a second battery and a second vibratory disc through which, by the use of certain infrared rays, the vibrations of our own world could be established. By turning the force from the disc on the very same spot where the dinner plate and the other articles had disappeared, I succeeded in recovering all of them. All were absolutely unchanged, and though several months had gone by, the cat had not suffered in any way from its fourth dimensional incarceration. The infrared device was portable, and I meant to take it with me on my visit to the new realm in company with Edgar Halpin. I, but not Halpin, would return anon to resume the threads of mundane existence. My experiments had all been carried on with utter secrecy. To mask their real nature, as well as to provide myself with the needful privacy, I had built a small laboratory in the woods of an uncultivated ranch that I owned, lying midway between Auburn and Bowman. Here I retired at varying intervals when I had the requisite leisure, ostensibly to conduct some chemical experiments of an educated but far from unusual type. I never admitted anyone to the laboratory, and no great amount of curiosity was evinced by friends and acquaintances regarding its contents or the tests I was carrying on. Never did I breathe a syllable to anyone that could indicate the true goal of my researches. I shall never forget the jubilation I felt when the infrared device had proven its practicality by retrieving the plate, the bust, the two volumes, and the cat. I was so eager for the consummation of my long-delayed revenge that I did not even consider a preliminary personal trip into the fourth dimension. I had determined that Edgar Halpin must precede me when I went. I did not feel, however, that it would be wise to tell him anything concerning the real nature of my device or the proposed excursion. Halpin, at this time, was suffering from recurrent attacks of terrific neuralgia. One day, when he had complained more than usual, I told him under the seal of confidence that I had been working on a vibratory invention for the relief of such maladies, and had finally perfected it. I'll take you out to the laboratory tonight and you can try it, I said. It will fix you up in a jiffy. All you'll have to do will be to sit in a chair and let me turn on the current, but don't say anything to anybody. Oh, thanks, old man, he rejoined. I'll certainly be grateful if you can do anything to stop this damnable pain. It feels like an electric drill's boring through my head all the time. I had chosen my time well, for all things were favorable to the maintenance of the secrecy I desired. Halpin lived on the outskirts of the town, and he was alone for the nonce, his housekeeper having gone away on a brief visit to some sick relative the night... Uh, <laughs> the night was murky and foggy, and I drove to Halpin's house and stopped for him shortly after the dinner hour, when few people were abroad. I do not think that anyone saw us when we left the town, I followed a rough and little-used by-road for most of the way to my laboratory, saying that I did not care to meet other cars in the thick fog if I could avoid it. We passed no one, and I felt that this was a good omen and that everything had combined to further my plan. Halpin uttered an exclamation of surprise when I turned on the lights in my laboratory. I didn't dream you had so much stuff here, he remarked, peering about with respectful curiosity at the long array of unsuccessful appliances which I had thrown aside in the course of my labors. I pointed to the chair above which the ultraviolet vibrator was suspended. Take a seat, Ed, I enjoined him. It will soon cure everything that ails you. Sure you aren't going to electrocute me? He joked as he obeyed my direction. A thrill of fierce triumph ran through me like the stimulation of some rare elixir, which, when he had seated himself. Everything was in my power now, and the moment of recompense for my ten years' humiliation and suffering was at hand. Halpin was so unsuspecting, the thought of any danger to himself, of any treachery on my part, would have been fantastically incredible to him. Putting my hand beneath my coat, I caressed the hilt of the hunting knife that I carried. All set? I asked him. Sure, Mike. Go ahead and shoot. 
I had found the exact range that would involve all of Halpin's body without affecting the chair itself. Fixing my gaze upon him, I pressed the little knob that turned on the current of vibratory rays. The result was practically instantaneous, for he seemed to melt like a puff of thinning smoke. I could still see his outlines for a moment, and the look of a phantasmal astonishment on his face. And then he was gone. Utterly gone. Perhaps it will be a source of wonderment that, having annihilated Halpin as far as all earthly existence was concerned, I was not content merely to leave him in the unseen, intangible plane to which he had been transposed. Would that I had been content to do so, but the wrong I had suffered was hot and cankerous within me, and I could not bear to think that he still lived in any form or upon any plane. Nothing but absolute death would suffice to assuage my resentment and the death must be inflicted by my own hand. It now remained to follow Halpin into that realm, which no man had ever visited before, and of whose geographical conditions and characteristics I had formed no idea whatever. I felt sure, however, that I could enter it and return safely after disposing of my victim. The return of the cat left no apparent room for doubt on that score. I turned out the lights, and seating myself in the chair with the portable infrared vibrator in my arms, I switched on the ultraviolet power. The sensation I felt was that of one who falls with nightmare velocity into a great gulf. My ears were deaf with the intolerable thunder of my descent. A frightful sickness overcame me, and I was near to losing all consciousness for a moment in the black vortex of roaring space and force that seemed to draw me nadirward through the ultimate pits. Then the speed of my fall was gradually retarded, and I came gently down to something that was solid beneath my feet. There was a dim glimmering of light that grew stronger as my eyes accustomed themselves to it. And by this light, I saw Halpin standing a few feet away. Behind him were dark amorphous rocks and the vague outlines of a desolate landscape of low mounds and primordial treeless flats. Even though I had hardly known what to expect, I was somewhat surprised by the character of the environment in which I found myself. At a guess, I would have said that the fourth dimension would be something more colorous and complex and varied, a land of multifold hues and many angled forms. However, in its drear and primitive desolation, the place was truly ideal for the commission of the act I had intended. Halpin came toward me in the doubtful light. There was a dazed and almost idiotic look on his face, and he stuttered a little as he tried to speak. What happened? He articulated at last. Never mind what happened. It isn't a circumstance to what's going to happen now. I laid the portable vibrator aside on the ground as I spoke. The dazed look was still on Halpin's face when I drew the hunting knife and stabbed him through the body with one clean thrust. In that thrust, all the stifled hatred all the cankering resentment of ten insufferable years was finally vindicated. He fell in a twisted heap, twitched a little, and lay still. The blood oozed very slowly from his side and formed a puddle. I remember wondering at its slowness, even then, for the oozing seemed to go on through hours and days. Somehow as I stood there, I was obsessed by a feeling of utter unreality. No doubt the long strain I had been under, the daily stress of indirect emotions and decade-deferred hopes had left me unable to realize the final consummation of my desire when it came. The whole thing seemed no more than one of the homicidal daydreams in which I had imagined myself stabbing help into the heart and seeing his hateful body lie before me. At length, I decided that it was time to effect my return for surely nothing could be gained by lingering any longer beside Halpin's corpse amid the unutterable dreariness of the fourth dimensional landscape. I erected the vibrator in a position where its rays could be turned upon myself and pressed the switch. I was aware of a sudden vertigo and felt that I was about to begin another descent into fathomless vortical gulfs. But, though the vertigo persisted, nothing happened, and I found that I was still standing beside the corpse in the same dismal milieu. Dumbfoundment and growing consternation crept over me. Apparently, for some unknown reason, the vibrator would not work in the way I had so confidently expected. Perhaps in these new surroundings, there was some barrier to the full development of the infrared power. I do not know, but, at any rate, there I was in a truly singular and far from agreeable predicament. 
I do not know how long I fooled in a mountain frenzy with the mechanism of the vibrator, in the hope that something had temporarily gone wrong and could be remedied if the difficulty were only found. However, all my tinkerings were of no avail. The machine was in perfect working order, but the required force was wanting. I tried the experiment of exposing small articles to the influence of the rays. A silver coin and a handkerchief dissolved and disappeared very slowly, and I felt that they must have regained the levels of mundane existence. But evidently, the vibrational force was not strong enough to transport a human body. Finally, I gave it up and threw the vibrator to the ground. In the surge of a violent despair that came upon me, I felt the need of a muscular action, a prolonged movement and I started off at once to explore the weird realm in which I had involuntarily imprisoned myself. It was an unearthly land, a land such as might have existed before the creation of life. There were undulating blanks of desolation beneath the uniform gray of a heaven without moon or sun or stars or clouds, from which an uncertain and diffused glimmering was cast upon the world beneath. There were no shadows, for the light seemed eminent to emanate from all directions. The soil was a gray dust in places and a gray vicinity of slime in others. And the low mounds I have already mentioned were like the backs of prehistoric monsters heaving from the primal ooze. There were no signs of insect or animal life. There were no trees, no herbs, and not even a blade of grass, a patch of moss or lichen, or a trace of algae. Many rocks were strewn chaotically through the desolation and their forms were such as an idiotic demon might have devised in aping the handiwork of God. The light was so dim that all things were lost at a little distance, and I could not tell whether the horizon was near or far. It seems to me that I must have wandered on for several hours, maintaining as, a direct, as direct a course of progression as I could. I had a compass, a thing that I always carry with me, but it refused to function and I was driven to conclude that there were no magnetic poles in this new world. Suddenly, as I rounded a pile of the vast amorphous boulders, I came to a human body that lay huddled on the ground and saw incredulously that it was Halpin. The blood still oozed from the fabric of his coat, and the pool it had formed was no larger than when I had begun my journey. I felt sure that I had not wandered in a circle, as people are said to do amid unfamiliar surroundings. How, then? could I have returned to the scene of my crime? The problem nearly drove me mad as I pondered it, and I set off with frantic vigor in an opposite direction from the one I had first taken. For all intents and purposes, the scene through which I now passed was identical with the one that lay on the other side of Halpin's corpse. It was hard to believe that the low mounds, the drear levels of dust and ooze and the monstrous boulders were not the same as those among which I had made my former way. As I went, I took out my watch with the idea of timing my progress, but the hands had stopped at the very moment when I had taken my plunge into unknown space from the laboratory, and though I wound it carefully, it refused to run again. After walking an enormous distance, during which, to my surprise, I felt no fatigue whatever, I came once more to the body I had sought to leave. I think that I went really mad then, for a little while. Now, after a duration of time, or eternity, which I have no means of computing. I am writing this penciled account on the leaves of my notebook. I am writing it beside the corpse of Edgar Halpin, from which I have been unable to flee, for a score of excursions into the dim realms on all sides have ended by bringing me back to it after a certain interval. The corpse is still fresh, and the blood has not dried. Apparently, the thing we know as time is well nigh non-existent in this world. Or at any rate, is seriously disordered in its action, and most of the normal concomitants of time are likewise absent, and space itself has the property of returning always to the same point. The voluntary movements I have performed might be considered as a sort of time sequence, but in regard to involuntary things there is little or no time movement. I experience neither physical weariness or hunger, but the horror of my situation is not to be conveyed in human language and hell itself can hardly have devised a name for it. When I have finished writing this narration, I shall precipitate the notebook into the levels of mundane life by means of the infrared vibrator. Some obscure need of confessing my crime and telling my predicament to others has led me to an act of which I should never have believed myself capable, for I am the most uncommunicative of men by nature. Apart from the satisfying of this need, 
the composition of my narrative is something to do. It is a temporary reprieve from the desperate madness that will surge upon me soon, and the grey eternal horror of the limbo to which I have doomed myself beside the undecaying body of my victim. A murder in the fourth dimension. I was going to read a third story, The Devotee of Evil, but we got off to a bit of a slow start, and it sounds like the party is still going, and I should probably make an appearance unless uh, everybody thinks all I do is go into the office and neglect my child. So, uh, thank you, uh, those couple of you who have joined us. If, uh, As always, if you know anybody that uh, likes to go on Twitch and shitpost and might enjoy listening to spooky stories, feel free to let them know about uh, the channel. I try to do this weekly, sometime during the weekend, Friday, Saturdays, Sundays. Um, and we'll either try doing this uh, earlier so that the, the European audience can join, or later at night. Um, I do have to say that we had more people when we did a later stream, although there was a thread I could share it in, so I'm not sure if it's the time of day or the lack of a thread that's to blame for our small but uh, worthwhile audience. So with that, uh, thank you very much for joining me. If you haven't subscribed, make sure to do so, so you get the little email saying that the channel has gone live, and I will see you again soon. <laughs>